Imagine the terror of Allied bomber crews over Europe in 1944 when a sleek silver ghost suddenly materialized beside their formations. No propeller, just pure speed. The Messerschmitt Mi-262 had arrived, and it changed everything. But halfway across the world, Japanese engineers were desperately trying to build their own version. They would fail spectacularly. The Mi-262 wasn't just another fighter plane, it was a glimpse into the future of warfare. While Allied pilots struggled with propeller-driven aircraft that topped out around 400 miles per hour, this German marvel could streak through the sky at 540 miles per hour. Picture the scene. American P-51 Mustangs diving at maximum speed, engines screaming only to watch helplessly as the jet fighter simply accelerated away like they were standing still. Twin Jumo 004 turbojet engines hung beneath swept wings, giving the aircraft an otherworldly appearance that matched its revolutionary performance. No propeller blur, no reciprocating engine vibration, just smooth, alien power that defied everything pilots thought they knew about flight. The Mi-262 could climb faster, turn tighter at high speeds, and engage targets with devastating effectiveness before vanishing into the clouds. Allied pilots nicknamed it the Stormbird, and for good reason, it struck like lightning and disappeared just as quickly. The aircraft's design was decades ahead of its time. Those swept wings weren't just aesthetic. They delayed the onset of compressibility effects that plagued straight-winged aircraft at high speeds. The tricycle landing gear, revolutionary in 1944, allowed for easier ground handling and better pilot visibility during taxi operations. Even the cockpit layout showed German engineering sophistication with instruments arranged for maximum efficiency during high-speed combat. But the Mi-262's true terror lay in its weapons. Four 30mm MK-108 cannons clustered in the nose could shred a B-17 flying fortress in seconds. Each cannon fired 650 rounds per minute of devastating high-explosive shells. Test pilot Chuck Yeager would later describe encountering one, it was like nothing we'd ever seen. Pure speed and power. The psychological impact was immediate. Bomber crews who survived attacks reported a new kind of fear, the helpless realization that their escort fighters simply couldn't catch this new predator. Lieutenant Colonel Johannes Steinhoff, one of the Mi-262's most successful pilots, described the experience. Flying the 262 was like stepping into the future. Everything happened faster, but with such precision. His unit alone destroyed over 200 Allied aircraft. By war's end, Mi-262s had shot down over 500 Allied aircraft while losing only 100 of their own in air combat. The jet age had begun, and Germany held the keys. By 1944, Japan's situation had become desperate. American B-29 superfortresses were systematically reducing Japanese cities to ash, flying so high that most Japanese fighters couldn't reach them. The few that could climb to 30,000 feet arrived exhausted, their piston engines gasping in the thin air while the massive bombers cruised serenely overhead, untouchable. Lieutenant Saburo Sakai, Japan's legendary ace, described the frustration in his combat reports. We climbed and climbed until our engines seized, but still they flew above us like silver gods. The psychological impact was devastating. Pilots who had once dominated the Pacific skies now felt helpless. The Mitsubishi A6M0, once the terror of Pearl Harbor and the Philippines, now seemed hopelessly obsolete against these high-altitude giants. Japanese radar operators tracked the bomber formations from hundreds of miles away, but could do nothing to stop them. Warning sirens wailed across Tokyo, Yokohama and Nagoya as civilians rushed to inadequate shelters. Night after night, the B-29s came with mechanical precision, 300 bombers at a time, 
each carrying 10 tons of incendiary bombs designed specifically to burn Japanese cities to the ground. Intelligence reports from Germany painted an incredible picture that seemed almost too good to be true. Submarine messages described a new German fighter that could outrun anything in the sky. Technical drawings arrived via diplomatic pouch in steel cylinders, showing an aircraft unlike anything Japanese engineers had seen. The Mi 262's specifications seemed almost impossible, 540 miles per hour in level flight, a service ceiling of 37,000 feet, and enough firepower to destroy a heavy bomber with a single burst. Admiral Yamamoto's staff realized immediately what this meant. If Japan could build jets, they might have a chance against the B-29 raids. The bomber's only defense was altitude and speed. A jet fighter could neutralize both advantages. Time was running out, but perhaps German technology could save them. Orders went out to Nakajima Aircraft Company. Study these plans and build Japan's first jet fighter. The future of the empire might depend on it. The pressure was immense. Every day brought new bombing raids, and Japanese industry was crumbling under the relentless assault. Factory workers labored in fear, knowing that tomorrow might bring another devastating attack. The Nakajima Kika emerged from desperate ambition and borrowed genius. Chief Engineer Kazuo Ono spread the German blueprints across his drafting table in early 1944, studying every line and curve of the Mi-262 by lamplight during frequent air raid blackouts. But this wouldn't be a simple copy. Japan lacked both the materials and manufacturing capability to reproduce the German design exactly. Ono's team faced an immediate problem. The kicker had to be smaller and lighter than its German inspiration. Japan's Ne-20 turbojet engines produced only 1,047 pounds of thrust each, compared to the Mi-262's powerful 1,980-pound Jumo 004s. The Japanese jet would need to weigh significantly less to achieve comparable performance. Every component had to be scrutinized, lightened, or eliminated entirely. The result looked strikingly similar to the Mi-262 from a distance. The same swept wings, twin engines mounted beneath, and revolutionary tricycle landing gear. But closer inspection revealed crucial differences born of necessity. The Kika's fuselage was narrower and shorter by nearly 8 feet. Its wingspan was reduced by almost 10 feet. The cockpit was more cramped, forcing pilots to operate in conditions that would have been considered unacceptable by German standards. Armament presented another compromise. Instead of four heavy 30mm cannons, the Kika would carry just two lighter guns, or, more ominously, a single 800kg bomb for kamikaze missions. This dual-purpose design revealed Japan's strategic desperation. The aircraft could serve as either an interceptor or the Empire's most sophisticated suicide weapon. Most tellingly, the Kika's cockpit was designed with a different philosophy entirely. While German pilots expected to return from multiple missions, Japanese engineers included provisions for suicide attacks. Bomb release mechanisms were positioned for single pilot operation. The fuel system could be quickly jettisoned to create a massive fireball on impact. This wasn't just a fighter. It was potentially Japan's most advanced kamikaze weapon. Wind tunnel tests at the Nakajima facility showed promise despite the compromises. Engineers worked in shifts around the clock, testing scale models in primitive but effective tunnels. On paper, the Kika's performance would be significantly inferior to its German cousin. Maximum speed of 432 miles per hour, service ceiling of 32,800 feet, but still impressive by Japanese standards. The question remained, could they actually build it? The reality of building a jet engine in 1944 Japan proved far more challenging than copying German blueprints. While Messerschmitt engineers worked with advanced nickel-chromium alloys capable of withstanding 1,500-degree turbine temperatures, Japanese metallurgists struggled with basic heat-resistant materials. 
Their best steel alloys would warp and fail after just a few hours of operation under the intense heat and stress of jet propulsion. Engineer Anshiro Hattori recorded his mounting frustration in his diary. We understand the principles, but lack the metals. Our turbine blades melt like candles in a furnace. Each test destroys weeks of work. The Ni-20 engine required constant replacement of critical components. Where German Jumo 004s could operate for 25 hours between major overhauls, Japanese engines were lucky to manage 10 hours before catastrophic failure threatened the entire aircraft. Manufacturing precision presented another nightmare that haunted Japanese engineers. Jet engines demand tolerances measured in thousandths of an inch, gaps that would barely accommodate a human hair. Japanese industry, devastated by constant bombing raids and chronic material shortages, struggled to maintain such precision. Machine tools vibrated from building damage. Skilled workers had been drafted into military service or killed in air raids. The results were predictably disastrous. Bearing races that should have been perfectly round came out oval, causing engines to vibrate themselves apart. Turbine blade angles varied by several degrees between individual pieces, creating dangerous imbalances at high RPMS. Fuel injection systems leaked, spraying volatile aviation fuel into hot engine compartments. Quality control, always challenging in wartime, became nearly impossible. The fuel situation presented equally dire challenges. Mi-262S ran on J-2 synthetic fuel, a carefully refined aviation kerosene developed specifically for jet engines. Japan had no equivalent production capability. The Kika would have to burn whatever aviation fuel remained in the Empire's rapidly depleting reserves, often contaminated gasoline that caused irregular combustion, engine fires and unpredictable power output. Testing revealed the harsh truth that Japanese engineers had dreaded. Their jet engines produced roughly half the thrust of German counterparts while consuming twice as much fuel. Reliability was abysmal. The technological gap wasn't just significant, it was potentially insurmountable given Japan's industrial limitations and wartime resource constraints. Time was running out and the obstacles seemed to multiply with each passing day. August 7, 1945. Test pilot Captain Susumu Takaoka climbed into the Kika's cramped cockpit at Kisarazu Airfield, unaware that thousands of miles away, an atomic bomb had just devastated Hiroshima. The morning sun glinted off the aircraft's polished aluminum skin as ground crews made final preparations for Japan's entry into the jet age. History was about to be made but not in the way anyone expected. The first flight lasted exactly 17 minutes and 23 seconds, a figure burned into Japanese aviation records. Takaoka later described the experience as like riding a wild horse that had never been properly broken. The Ni-20 engine spooled up with an unfamiliar whine, completely different from the familiar roar of piston engines. The sound was alien, almost musical, but somehow ominous. Acceleration was smooth but disappointingly sluggish, nothing like the brutal thrust German test pilots reported from the Mi-262. The kicker needed nearly twice the runway length to achieve takeoff speed. Climbing to 1,600 feet, Takaoka discovered the aircraft's limitations immediately. The jet felt heavy and unresponsive compared to conventional fighters. Maximum speed during that first flight barely exceeded 340 miles per hour, far short of the predicted 432 miles per hour and laughably inferior to the Mi-262's 540 miles per hour performance. More troubling were the engines themselves. Temperature gauges crept steadily into the red zone after just 10 minutes of flight. Exhaust gas temperatures soared beyond safe limits. The port engine began producing irregular thrust, causing the aircraft to yaw unexpectedly. Takaoka found himself constantly fighting the controls, something that should never happen during a routine test flight. 
The handling characteristics revealed additional problems that wind tunnel tests hadn't predicted. The Kika exhibited dangerous tendencies at low speeds, requiring constant pilot attention to prevent stalls that could prove fatal. Landing approach speeds were frighteningly high, much faster than any Japanese pilot was accustomed to flying. The revolutionary tricycle landing gear, copied directly from German designs, proved difficult for pilots trained exclusively on conventional tailwheel aircraft. A second flight on August 11th ended in near disaster when the port engine flamed out during takeoff climb. Takaoka managed an emergency landing on a single engine, a testament to his skill rather than the aircraft's design. Post-flight inspection revealed extensive heat damage to turbine components, cracked exhaust pipes, and fuel system leaks. The damage would have grounded the aircraft for weeks of repairs that Japan simply didn't have time, materials, or expertise to complete. Emperor Hirohito's surrender broadcast on August 15, 1945, found the Kika program in shambles, its dreams of aerial supremacy reduced to twisted metal and broken promises. Only two prototypes had been completed and neither had demonstrated performance even remotely close to original specifications. The dream of Japanese jet fighters sweeping American bombers from the sky died with the Empire itself in a radio announcement that changed the world forever. Allied investigators who examined the Kika wreckage after Japan's surrender were struck by both the ambitious scope and the tragic futility of the project. Colonel Harold Watson, leading the technical intelligence team, reported, the Japanese clearly understood jet principles and possessed remarkable engineering talent, but lacked the industrial capability to execute them effectively. Their engines were perhaps five years behind German technology, operating under conditions that would be considered primitive by Western standards. The Nakajima engineering team had faced an impossible task that would have challenged even the most advanced industrial nations. Building effective jet fighters required not just blueprints, but an entire industrial ecosystem of specialized alloys, precision manufacturing equipment, extensive testing facilities, and years of developmental time. Germany had spent the better part of a decade developing these capabilities before the Mi-262 flew successfully. Japan attempted to compress that entire development cycle into mere months while under constant bombing attack. Perhaps most tragically, the Kika's kamikaze mission capability revealed the depth of Japan's strategic desperation in the war's final months. While German Mi-262s were designed as defensive interceptors intended to return for multiple missions, the Kika was conceived partly as a sophisticated suicide weapon, the ultimate expression of Japan's willingness to sacrifice everything for military advantage. This fundamental difference in operational philosophy highlighted how far the nation had fallen from its earlier position of technological and strategic strength, the program's failure wasn't merely technical, it was symbolic of Japan's broader industrial collapse as the war reached its devastating conclusion. No amount of borrowed genius, engineering skill or desperate determination could overcome the fundamental reality of a nation's exhausted resources, damaged infrastructure and broken supply chains. The Kika represented the last gasp of Japanese aviation innovation. A brilliant idea crushed by impossible circumstances. The Kika stands as a testament to innovation constrained by harsh reality. Japanese engineers possessed the vision to recognize the jet fighter's revolutionary potential, but lacked the resources to transform that vision into operational success. In the end, copying genius requires more than blueprints. It demands the entire industrial foundation that made the original possible. One can only wonder, what if Japan had started five years earlier?